While 3D printers are technology that many people are familiar with, there's one 250 miles above us on the International Space Station, or ISS, that's unlike anything currently found on Earth. It's known as the Refabricator, a hybrid 3D printer that can recycle its hard polymer plastic numerous times to make new items. About the size of a dorm room refrigerator, the device is controlled by operators on Earth who oversee its manufacturing via video cameras. Nikki Werkheiser, NASA's in-space manufacturing manager at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, says, Recyclers on Earth grind plastic pellets to create their products. But that grinding creates material shear, which prevents you from reusing that plastic again. It's no longer strong enough. For this technology demonstration, the company, Tethers Unlimited, developed a novel recycling process that doesn't require grinding, and that allows us to recycle the plastic multiple times. The ability to reuse the plastic over and over again is essential for long-term space exploration. Werkheiser says, We can replace a lot of the things we need when we're orbiting above Earth. We just have them delivered on a resupply mission. But when you're in deep space, you don't have that option. You have to have the ability to make all the parts you might need and without having a large stockpile of extra materials. The refabricator can even recycle plastic items not normally associated with earthbound 3D printers. For instance, almost all of the materials that are delivered to the station are packed using foam or plastic bags. Both can be loaded into the refabricator to deliver items such as a plastic syringe, an eating utensil, or a custom-made wrench. That ability limits the amount of backup materials you need to take with you on a long-range expedition. After all, in space, space is at a premium. The refabricator's technology demonstration will be composed of two phases. During each phase, the refabricator will perform seven cycles of recycling and printing parts while on board the ISS. All of the items printed by the refabricator will eventually be sent back to Earth for testing and analysis to determine the effects of repeated recycling on the material properties of the plastic. Werkheiser notes, I'm very excited about this technology both in space and back on Earth. I can envision a day where you go to the grocery store and drop your water bottles and plastic bags into a refabricator and then select your new phone case or a kitchen gadget or the raw filament that you can use in your 3D printer at home.
follow-on satellites will launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. GRACE is a gravity mission. It's a, it's a mission that measures the gravity of the Earth. The thing that's really important about GRACE is it measures the change in the Earth's gravity from one month to the next, and that tells you how mass moves around the Earth. And the only thing that really moves around from one month to the next is water. And so it can tell us things like changes in sea level rises. It can give us a complete map of the melting of ice in Greenland or Antarctica. Um, but it can also tell us how the groundwater changes in the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, from one month to the next. What GRACE does is it puts up two satellites, which are 200 kilometres apart, and they're basically following each other around in this orbit. And when one of them passes over an area of higher mass concentration, it speeds up and then slows down. The satellites are 200 kilometres apart, and they move closer together and further apart by about the diameter of a red blood cell. If the groundwater level changes by only a few millimetres, that's enough that the spacecraft 500 kilometres away can sense that motion, and then we can use that to inform policy makers or farmers who are using, relying on irrigation um, about where things are headed and, and what we need to do to change. So this will be the first mission that shoots laser beams between spacecraft and makes what's called a coherent measurement. This is actually the same technology that the multi-billion dollar gravitational wave detector mission that will launch in around a decade will rely on. Um, and there are already plans to do missions not just around Earth, but also around Mars and other planets to map uh, the mass and the water in those planets. One of the things I loved about this project is it brought together people from all over. Uh, it brought together scientists, engineers, physicists, uh, people who studied geology, um, and it brought them from the ANU, from CSIRO, and even private companies, EOS Space Systems, um, to, to bring all that expertise together and deliver something which is really world leading. Hey, what's up everybody? So NASA wants to expand into the solar system, and especially with humans, they want to go around the moon, to a near-Earth asteroid, and to Mars. NASA is building the Space Launch System and Orion capsule to enable deep space exploration, but for some of the other key technologies, NASA is turning to the commercial sector for new innovative technology. And that's what we're going to be talking about for today's Space Pod for May 28, 2015. NASA has a program to facilitate this process called Next Step, and it recently awarded 12 partnerships on advanced concept studies in three main areas, including propulsion, habitation, and small satellites. For propulsion, NASA is looking at high-powered electric propulsion in the 300 kilowatt range, such as the Vasimir engine being developed by the Ad Astra rocket company. They're going to use their Next Step Award to develop and test an advanced version of their Vasimir engine, which they've been working on for a couple of years now, and it's going to electrically charge plasma in order to get its thrust. Aerojet Rocketdyne is going to use their award on the development of a power processing unit that will be able to get them in the 250 kilowatt range for their nested hull thruster. And also a company named MSNW LLC of Redmond, Washington is teaming up with the University of Washington to build an ion thruster that is capable of somewhere between the 100 to 300 kilowatt range and can use traditional propellants as well as propellants that are manufactured from resources available during deep space missions like the asteroid retrieval mission. How exactly they're going to do that isn't clear yet, but it is an interesting concept. Regarding habitation for the astronauts on deep space missions, the Orion capsule, although cramped, is okay for missions lasting a few days or even weeks. But for missions lasting three months or more, the astronauts are just simply going to need more space and supplies. So the seven concepts looking to provide that space and supplies are coming from Bigelow Aerospace using their BA330 module. Their concept would illustrate how their habitats could be used to support long duration missions. They've been working on their inflatable habitats for a long time, and an experimental module is sitting at Cape Canaveral right now and is going to be launched later this year to be tested out at the International Space Station. One of the other habitat concepts comes from Boeing, which would be using a low cost habitat based off of the modules they've built for the International Space Station. Boeing did produce the Unity module, the Destiny Laboratory, and the Quest airlock, so they do have some experience in manufacturing these types of modules. 
Orbital ATK also got a partnership looking at using their Cygnus cargo spacecraft. They're planning on building an extended Cygnus spacecraft, as well as under this proposal a docking node that would be able to have a modular configuration of different Cygnus spacecraft and similar size logistic modules. Lockheed Martin also has a habitat proposal in partnership with Tails Alenia Space. Tails Alenia Space has built several modules for the International Space Station, including the European Space Agency's Columbus module, the multi-purpose logistics module, including the permanent multi-purpose module Leonardo, which it just so happens was just moved from the Earth-facing port of the Unity module to the forward-facing port of the Tranquility module. This was done to make room for the new docking adapters for the commercial spacecraft that hopefully will be soon servicing the space station. Some of the other habitat-related proposals come from Dianetics, which is working on an advanced CO2 scrubber that not only would be more reliable and require less maintenance, but would also be modular and be able to be used in multiple systems, not just habitats, but also spacesuits and possibly even compact emergency life support modules. Also, a company called Hamilton Sunstrom Space Systems International out of Windsor Locks, Connecticut is working on larger, modular, advanced life support systems that would require less integration and maximize commonality between different components. Also, another really cool idea comes from a company called Orbitech out of Madison, Wisconsin, which is working on what they're calling a hybrid life support system. Essentially, they're wanting to grow plants and microorganisms directly into the wall of one of these habitats and essentially have a natural life support system recycling carbon dioxide and producing oxygen and all sorts of other good gases and chemicals that the astronauts breathe. This idea has a lot of applications and could go beyond a hybrid life support system. The other area of the Next Step program is their small satellites, in this case CubeSats. They're looking at two so far that would potentially launch on the first Space Launch System and Orion capsule test flight. This mission would be flying around the moon, similar to an Apollo 8 mission profile. And they would have these CubeSats as secondary payloads that would be able to be deployed and look at the moon. The first CubeSat is also a proposal by Lockheed Martin called Skyfire, which would be getting infrared sensor data from the lunar surface. And this CubeSat would actually be a six unit CubeSat. The other CubeSat is being developed by Moorhead State University of Moorhead, Kentucky, and is in partnership with the Busek Company, which I've never heard of, NASA Goddard, and the Catholic University of America. Hmm. Anyway, this CubeSat is designed to search for water ice and other resources in an orbit of around 62 miles above the surface of the moon. This would also be a six unit CubeSat they're calling IceCube. And results from these studies and hardware developments would determine the role for international partner involvement in some of these future missions of going around the moon, going to a near Earth asteroid, possibly even going back to the surface of the moon, but definitely to go to Mars. So I think this program is a really great idea, and although these are just concept studies right now, it could lead to a lot of really cool things in the future. And these are at least the sort of technologies that NASA is seriously looking at to accomplish their stated goals so far. I know there's a lot more that NASA wants to do, but there's politics involved, and I do not want to get into that in this video right now. So I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, coming up, I'm going to be talking about in a future space pods, I've gotten some requests to talk about not only the United Arab Emirates Space Agency, but also the Brazilian Space Agency. So we're going to talk about those in the future space pod, but there's also been some really cool space news stuff that's been happening. And if I don't see you guys on the live show, then we're going to have to just try to talk about some of all this really cool stuff that's been happening in a future future pod next week. Thank you for watching this video. My name is Michael Clark. Please leave a comment about all these different proposals and which ones you guys think are not only really cool but have a high likelihood of success. And let me know if you want me to go into any more detail about any of these particular proposals. If you'd like to help us to bring you space news like this, then please visit patreon.com slash spacepod to find out more information about how you can crowdfund this show. Thank you so much to everyone who's contributed already, and literally every single penny helps. Thank you so much. Until the next time I see you guys, keep moving onwards and upwards. We expect to have a payload capability of 150 tons to low orbit. 
so, and that you know, compares to about 30 for, for, um, for, for Falcon Heavy, uh, which is par partially reusable. Where this really makes a tremendous difference is in the cost, which I'll come to in some of the later slides. Um, so let's, let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and just, oh, just a, by, by the way, if, if, if um, yeah, so with um, BFR, you can get a sense of scale by looking at the tiny person there. Um, it's really quite, quite a big vehicle. Main body diameter is about, is about nine meters or 30 feet. Um, and it consists of, of th the, the booster is lifted by 31 Raptor engines that produce a, a, th a thrust of about 5,400 tons lifting 40, a 4,400 ton vehicle straight up. So then, just the ba basics about the ship, 48 meter length, uh, dry mass we're expecting to be about 85 tons. Or technically, our design says 75 tons, but inevitably this mass growth. Um, and that ship can, will contain 1,100 tons of propellant uh, with a design, of, uh, an ascent design of 150 tons and a return uh, mass of, of 50. Um, so you, you can think of this as essentially combining the upper stage of, of the rocket with Dragon. It's like your Falcon 9 upper stage and Dragon were combined. So as we, I'll go into each of these items in detail, but 